Uh, yeah, all right, good evening, everybody, and let's talk about the fall of man, which the fall of man should be, but isn't, but should be, uh, the most boringly uh, obvious topic that ever gets discussed in the Christian church. It should be so obvious that it doesn't even bear mentioning, but for some reason it does. And the only reason that it's complicated is because people uh, have a hard time understanding it as it relates to themselves. They have no problem figuring out that human beings are fallen when they see everybody else, because as we were just discussing, when you have things like COVID restrictions happening and more lockdowns occurring, as we just heard uh, this week, or I guess today, uh, spoiler alert, everybody who's watching at home, uh, services are now limited to 30 people. Uh, and that's it, there's a hard cap at 30. Will there be a hard cap at 30 for Christmas Eve? I don't know. I have no way of knowing that. Uh, so far now, you know what I know. But the whole reason they have to institute these caps and these limits and whatnot is because people uh, have not been able to be trusted to do what they're supposed to do, what they've been told to do. They've been told to do things in a certain way, in a certain capacity, and every time the restrictions change, it's almost always because they say, well, we had these restrictions of two meters of distance, work at home if you can, wear a mask, that kind of thing. And then they have to add more rules because people weren't doing those things. Every once in a while, somebody has a little sneaky wedding or something like that, where they have 150 people and the whole thing goes off the rails again. The whole idea is that if we were keeping the first batch of rules, we wouldn't need the second. Uh, but of course, people by and large assume that they are the exception to the rule. Now, the other thing that the fall of man does, and it, it has to do this, is when we get painted into the corner uh, of uh, doctrine that says Christians uh, have to deal with the idea that if God is good, which we believe that he is, and uh, he wants to uh, alleviate suffering, which he does, but there is still suffering on earth, how does that happen? Did God make evil or did he not? And this question tends to fall down to the issue of the fall of humanity. So let's start in chapter 5, if we may. The Christian answer to the question proposed in the last chapter is contained in the doctrine of the fall. According to that doctrine, man is now a horror to God and to himself, and a creature ill-adapted to the universe, not because God made him so, but because he has made himself so by the abuse of his free will. To my mind, this is the sole function of the doctrine. It exists to guard against two sub-Christian theories of the origin of evil. Monism, according to which God himself, being above good and evil, produces impartially the effects to which we give these two names, and dualism, according to which God produces good while some equal and independent power produces evil. Against both these views, Christianity asserts that God is good, that he made all things good and for the sake of their goodness, that one of the good things he made, namely the free will of rational creatures, by its very nature included the possibility of evil and that creatures availing themselves of this possibility have become evil. Now this function, which is the only one I allow to the doctrine of the fall, must be distinguished from two other functions, which it is sometimes perhaps represented as performing, but which I reject. In the first place, I do not think the doctrine answers the question, was it better for God to create than not to create? That is a question I have already declined. Since I believe God to be good, I am sure that if the question has a meaning, the answer must be yes. But I doubt whether the question has any meaning, and even if it has, I am sure that the answer cannot be attained by the sort of value judgment which men can significantly make. In the second place, I do not think the doctrine of the fall can be used to show that it is just, in terms of retributive justice, to punish individuals for the faults of their remote ancestors. Some forms of doctrine seem to involve this, but I question whether any of them is understood by its exponents really meant it. The fathers may sometimes say that we are punished for Adam's sin, but they more often say that we sinned in Adam. It may be impossible to find out what they meant by this, or we may decide that what they meant was erroneous. But I do not think that we can dismiss their way of talking as a mere idiom. Wisely or foolishly, they believe that we were really, and not simply by legal fiction, involved in Adam's action. The attempt to formulate this belief by saying we were in Adam in a physical sense, Adam being the first vehicle of the immortal germ plasm, may be unacceptable, but it is, of course, a further question whether belief itself is merely a confusion or a real insight into spiritual realities beyond our normal grasp. All right, that's a lot of old gobbledygook mainly, but 
Uh, first of all, was it better for God to make or not to make? We can say, yes, it is fine for God to make things. It's not a big deal, given that things are made. And it would be very difficult for us to say that it was the evil of God to have made anything, given that the possibility of suffering may exist. Uh, but also, this idea that we sinned in Adam. In Adam, we are all one, etc., etc. This involves the, uh, the nature of the fall, which, as C.S. Lewis says, is uh, the entire nature of the fall, the entire purpose of it, is to discuss uh, how we are now sinful people, how we are now sinful and broken, how there does come to be evil in the world. That is the point and the idea of the doctrine of the fall. And sure enough, the doctrine of the fall does answer that question. It's what bridges the gap between God making everything, saying that it is good, and then us living in a world in which people don't keep the rules, break them voluntarily, and go out of their way to do things that are wrong and bad. If God makes everything to be good, but things aren't good, we have to ask, what is the prime, uh, prime uh, reason, prime cause of human misery? And the answer tends to be, by and large, humans. Like we tend, like there are other factors, and we'll get into those later. But by and large, we do bad things to each other. And that is part of the concept of free will existing. So we also have to get away from the idea that we are being still punished or, 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 or our evil is connected to Adam's sin uh, as, as like a direct thing. Like because Adam ate a fruit a long time ago that we are still being punished for that action, that that action was so bad by its nature that we are still incurring punishment for it. All that, that action does, really, is to create and build in human beings what we call concupiscence. Now, that's a long term for a very simple concept, and concupiscence merely says that if you know what the right thing to do and the wrong thing to do you know what both those options are, you are likely to take the wrong one instead of the right one. That you will have a motivation to do what is easy and quick and cheap and underhanded rather than doing the right thing. That one has to be taught and built into you with a lot of effort. Uh, that's why when you see rioting, uh, it's almost always accompanied by looting. That people, once they realize that the police are not going to stop any of this activity, they will begin to steal and steal very rapidly. They'll take everything that's not nailed down and indeed some things that are. That's how that works, where when you know the cops aren't going to catch you, you start stealing pretty rapidly and you can set your watch by that. None of these riots that you see are unique in any way or capacity. They all work in the same way because it's human beings that are doing the protesting, then the rioting, then the looting. That's how that works. Ah. At the moment, however, this question does not arise, for as I have said, I have no intention of arguing that the descent to modern man of inabilities contracted by his remote ancestors is a specimen of retributive justice. For me, it is rather a specimen of those things necessarily involved in the creation of a stable world, which we considered in chapter 2. It would, no doubt, have been possible for God to remove by miracle the, first, the results of the first sin ever committed by a human being, but this would not have been much good unless he was prepared to remove the results of the second and of the third and so on forever. If the miracles ceased, then sooner or later we might have reached our present lamentable situation. If they did not, then a world thus continually underpropped and corrected by divine interference would have been a world in which nothing important ever depended on human choice and in which choice itself would soon cease from the certainty that one of the apparent alternatives before you would lead to no results and was therefore not really an alternative. As we saw, the chess player's freedom to play chess depends on the rigidity of the squares and the moves. Having isolated what I conceive to be the true import of the doctrine that man has fallen, let us now consider the doctrine in itself. The story in Genesis is a story full of the deepest suggestion about a magic apple of knowledge. But in the developed doctrine, the inherent magic of the apple has quite dropped out of sight and the story is simply one of disobedience. I have the deepest respect even for pagan myths, still more for myths in Holy Scripture. I therefore do not doubt that the version which emphasizes the magic apple and brings together the trees of life and knowledge contains a deeper and subtler truth than the version which makes the apple simply and solely a pledge of obedience. 
but I assume that the Holy Spirit would not have allowed the latter to grow up in the church and win the assent of great doctors, unless it also was true and useful as far as it went. It is this version which I am going to discuss, because though I suspect the primitive version to be more profound, I know that I, at any rate, cannot penetrate its profundities. I am, I am to give my readers the best, n not the best absolutely, but the best that I have. This, uh, um, I mean, I've only really ever understood it as the, uh, as the disobedience and what the disobedience brings to it. This intermingling and these trees of life and knowledge and this deeper and subtler truth, I am ill-equipped uh, to uh, discuss myself as well. I'm not sure what's being gotten at by that. And I don't dare tend to guess. Maybe it's important, uh, but I hope not. In the developed doctrine, then, it is claimed that man, as God made him, was completely good and completely happy, but that he disobeyed God and became what we now see. Many people think that this proposition has been proved false by modern science. We now know it is said that so far from having fallen out of a primeval state of virtue and happiness, men have slowly risen from brutality and savagery. There seems to me to be a complete confusion here. Brute and savage both belong to that unfortunate class of words which are sometimes used rhetorically as terms of reproach and sometimes scientifically as terms of description. And the pseudo-scientific argument against the fall depends on a confusion between the usages. If by saying that man rose from brutality you mean simply that man is physically descended from animals, I have no objection. But it does not follow the further back you go, the more brutal, in the sense of wicked or wretched, you will find man to be. No animal has moral virtue, but it is not true that all animal behavior is of the kind one should call wicked, if it were practiced by men. On the contrary, not all animals treat other creatures of their own species as badly as men treat men, not all are as gluttonous or as lecherous as we are, and no animal is ambitious. Similarly, if you say that the first men were savages, mean that their artifacts were few and clumsy like those of modern savages, you may well be right. But if you mean that they were savage in the sense of being lewd, ferocious, cruel, and treacherous, you will be going beyond your evidence, and that for two reasons. In the first place, modern anthropologists and missionaries are less inclined than their fathers to endorse your unfavorable picture even of the modern savage. In the second place, you cannot argue from the artifacts of the earliest men that they were all, in, in all respects, like the contemporary people who make similar artifacts. We must be on our guard here against an illusion which the study of prehistoric man seems naturally to beget. I'll stop there for a second uh, before I get in trouble for using the word savage. I'm just reading the book, folks. Uh, I am, I'm adding no commentary on that so as I not get yelled at. But yeah. Um, the, the question of the development of humanity uh, is going to be extremely interesting when it intersects with the story of the fall because it asks a question of who and what we are at a pretty base level. Because of course, the way in which human beings act, react, and approach things of a moral nature is quite different from the way in which the animal kingdom operates by and large. Now, there, this is one of those situations in which like, it tends to get explained that the reason that we behave in the way that we do is because it presents certain uh, evolutionary advantages and blah, blah, blah. Now, that is because if you begin from the framework uh, that says that things evolve over time and then you end up with humanity, then you basically have to say that whatever people are doing has to have some sort of evolutionary benefit to it, whether you can see it or not. That's usually how that works. So, and I'm not going to get very God of the gaps on it because I don't like to do that, but uh, you have to account for uh, people's behavior in, in like, a, like a social universe, in them being uh, caring and altruistic and good even to people that are outside of their own family or tribe or community or something like that. You have to account for that kind of behavior which the animal world, by and large, doesn't really tend to do. It's not very good at that. I mean, I'm sure in the chat somebody's going to come up with some sort of awesome example of like pangolins that are very, very good at helping, I don't know, echidnas or whatever. But uh, And now somebody in chat's going to say, those live on different continents. And I'll say, I know, I know, I know. Uh, was there a hand up over there? Sure. We got to talk to one of the uh, wildlife guys who was 
keeping track of the internal politics of the wolf pack. Okay. It sounded very human. Sure. Um, and but you don't have the wolves doing their best to ensure the survival of the ants with which they share territory uh, to their own detriment. Uh, that doesn't happen either. Uh, that there are, there are certain things that seem to fall to us as, as moral beings and as, as, as stewards of, the, of creation that don't seem to fall to anything else. Uh, so our closest relatives, so they say chimpanzees and bonobos, are environmentalists only by virtue of not being able to ruin things more, not because they are very sensitive and caring. If they could chop down the forest and... Uh, yeah, exactly so. I mean, if, if they could figure out a way of cutting everything down and making rubber plants and stealing all the bananas, I'm sure they would. They're only prevented from doing so by an inability, not a lack of desire. They are not... Anytime somebody looks at uh, natural animals and says, gosh, don't they live in harmony with nature? They don't have a choice. Like, like they, are, they are severely limited uh, in terms of what they can and can't do. Now, because we aren't, we tend to be either able to ride right off the rails on this stuff or to be good caretakers of the world. But nothing else does that. Nothing else has that kind of mind to do it. Now, it makes me think of, uh, there's a line in the first Matrix when Mr. Smith or whatever mm. is explaining to Neo that the, the Earth or the system always tends to exist in equilibrium, uh, but the people with free will are always the ones who sort of pervert it yeah. uh, and break it down. Well, yeah, and, and like, like that's us, right? Um, and this... I mean, like, like he talks about the, the modern savage, which again, we've got to really distance ourselves from now lest we get to some very angry letters. Again, if you want to send an angry letter to me for saying words like the modern savage and whatnot, please address them to C.S. Lewis, care of local churchyard, because he's been dead for a few years. But um, he does have a, uh, a semi-favorable picture of people that he would refer to as uh, modern savages and against prehistoric people. Uh, let's carry on. Prehistoric man, because he is prehistoric, is known to us only by the material things he made, or rather by a chance selection from among the more durable things he made. It is not the fault of archaeologists that they have no better evidence, but this penury can, constitutes a continual temptation to infer more than we have any right to infer, to assume that the community which made the superior artifacts was superior in all respects. Everyone can see that the assumption is false. It would lead to the conclusion that the leisured classes of our own time were in all respects uh, superior to those of the Victorian age. Clearly, the prehistoric men who made the worst pottery might have made the best poetry, and we should never know it. And the assumption becomes even more absurd when we are comparing prehistoric men with modern savages. The equal crudity of artifacts here tells you nothing about the intelligence or virtue of the makers. What is learned by trial and error must begin by being crude, whatever the character of the beginner. The very same pot which would prove its maker a genius if it were the first pot ever made in the world would prove its maker a dunce if it came after millenniums of pot making. The whole modern estate of primitive man is based upon that idolatry of artifacts, which is a great corporate sin of our own civilization. We forget that our prehistoric ancestors made all the useful discoveries except that of chloroform which have ever been made. To them we owe language, the family, clothing, the use of fire, the domestication of animals, the wheel, the ship, poetry, and agriculture. Good, I want to stop there for a second. That uh, I, I know it's a, a very great amusing thing to sort of look back in time uh, and say, boy, weren't those people who lived back then foolish and, and dumb and simple-minded and, and, uh, and soppy, when in reality, uh, they got a lot done with very little. Uh, did you guys remember that time? Was it last summer? Something like that, where those two guys were on the run up in like northern Ontario, northern Manitoba? It was in the spring, right. Uh, remember when you could like just find out about news stories and go, oh, isn't that interesting, without like every single piece of news you ever got being world ending. But they, they killed people and then vanish into the woods, and, and people were like guessing, saying, well, you know, what are they going to do up there? How are they going to survive in the wilderness in like northern Manitoba, northern Ontario? Because, of course, we've gotten to the point now 
where if you get dropped off in the wilderness of northern Manitoba, northern Ontario, that's kind of it for you. Uh, there's a <laughs> you're not going to be making a new civilization up there. You'll be lucky to last a couple of days until you get picked up. Right, that's about as far as you get. Surely enough, those two guys killed themselves while they were up there. Um, but the odds of you surviving beyond like a week by yourself uh, are pretty limited. Now, but we also know that there have been people living up there for a very long time uh, who were doing, I mean, we're, I'm going to say in quotation marks, just fine. I mean, we would view the way they were living as a big step down from the way that we were living, but you can't dismiss them. Anybody who lived in the vast centuries before us is just being simple-minded and foolish, when in reality, they were able to do far more with far less than we're able to do. I mean, right now, and, and this is a point that I've made before and I'll make it again, you all do the same thing I do when the power goes out, right? The power goes out and you go, well, I'll just wait for it to come back on. That, that's my day now. Uh, and, and I'll go to bed and I'll hope it's back on in the morning. That's as far as we get, right? Uh, when when uh, like the, the most recent time we had anything like that happen was when we like ran out of toilet paper or whatever, or flour, and for most people, like, that was it. You're like, well, shoot, now what do we do? Uh, there were very few people organizing collectives to grind wheat or whatever. That wasn't happening very much because the idea is that the supply chain will pick back up and take care of us because we've become very used to it. The distancing yourself by your, from your ancestors by saying, like, weren't they foolish? Weren't they dumb? Didn't they know nothing about anything? Those useless Bronze Age savages, like, no... I know they had to do a lot of the trial and error, but they got an awful lot done with pretty meager resources. One of my favorite things is to think about the, the, the narrow amount of time between the first flight, like that the Wright brothers made at Kill Devil Hills, and when people went to the moon. Like it wasn't that long of a period of time between those two things. We're not talking hundreds of years. We're talking, what, 60? Yeah, 60 years. So within a human lifespan, we went from no powered flight to rocketing to the moon. That's insane. Like, that is so fast. Um, but you have to understand that a lot of trial and error had to go into that. Uh, and it does you no good to like, denigrate the people living in the Wright Brothers' time and saying, boy, didn't their planes stink? Yeah, I'm sure next to the space shuttle, they weren't that great. But you have to understand people are working with what they've got. And they're working very hard at those things. Science then has nothing to say for or against the doctrine of the fall. A more philosophical difficulty has been raised by the modern theologian to whom all students of the subject are most indebted. This writer, apparently who is N.P. Williams, uh, points out that the idea of sin presupposes a law to sin against. And since it would take centuries for the herd instinct to crystallize into custom and for custom to harden into law, the first man, if there ever was a being who could be so described, could not commit the first sin. This argument assumes that virtue and the herd instinct commonly coincide and that the first sin was essentially a social sin. But the traditional doctrine points to a sin against God, an act of disobedience, not a sin against the neighbor. And certainly, if we are to hold the doctrine of the fall in any real sense, we must look for the great sin on a deeper and more timeless level than that of social morality. Yeah, I do want to stop there for a second and to continue to make the case that morals, like some sort of law, capital L law, stands outside of social convention. Like those two things are not identical, they're not the exact same thing. So we can't, there are certain laws, I would say all the laws of God, but certain laws that we can't arbitrarily change to suit ourselves because we happen to have hit the point that we're at right now. Some people may disagree. I mean, Richard Dawkins, when he was talking about this, he had to concede and say, well, yeah, we just think that rape and murder are wrong because we've evolved in that direction, but we could have evolved in a different direction. Well, gee, thanks. Well, that, that's nice to think about, the idea that we just happened to luck into thinking that rape is bad. I mean, I would have thought that that was bad universally, but the point that he has to make if you're saying that there are no laws that are larger than just the laws that we have based on our convention, that kind of thing, and that there's nothing inherently moral or immoral about anything, 
then you have to concede that things could have been different had things developed differently. Uh, it's a far more comforting thing to say that there are certain laws that are like sort of hardwired uh, and that you don't decide to keep or, or, or to not keep. The ones that C.S. Lewis brings up is when he says things like, there are no civilizations in which cowardice and, and lying and, and things like that are viewed as being good, like universally good. Like being a traitor or, or, or a thief or whatever is not considered to be good by basically anybody. It's not as though there's a society that has evolved and developed and just said, yeah, just, uh, just lie and betray everybody and we're all fine with it. Like nobody's okay with that, obviously. We all get that. And we would like to assume that if you ran the experiment again of creating human beings out of a petri dish somewhere, if you ran the experiment again and again and again, you would get to the same results over and over and over again because there's something bigger and larger behind that that governs it as opposed to just, well, we got lucky this time and we happen to have these morals the way we do. Not everything can just fall down to social convention and because of that, the initial sin isn't a social convention thing either because again, if it's a big one, if it matters, then it can't be based on social convention because social convention, like those kinds of social laws, are the things that change and change rapidly. He talked about the Victorians. Uh, does anybody know how people were dressing in Victorian times? Whoosh, ooh la la. Uh, that's a, that's a, Chris, if you can call the picture of a woman in Victorian dress, or even of Queen Victoria herself, why not? Uh, it was, it's, it's a lot. Look, look at all those crinolines over there. That, that's that's quite, the, uh, quite the effort to squeeze yourself into all those things uh, for the purposes of your human convention happening. It's a lot of effort. And that would have been seen as like shocking to go out dressed the way that like most modern people do right now, where we are, we're all dressed as though we're going to the beach all the time, uh, according to the Victorians, I suppose. But even they wouldn't dress the way we do at the beach. They dress in like full body gowns and such like that, even to go to the paddling pools. This sin has been described by St. Augustine as the result of pride, of the moment whereby a creature that is an essentially dependent being whose principle of existence lies not only in itself but in another, tries to set up on its own to exist for itself. Such a sin requires no complex social conditions, no extended experience, no great intellectual development, from the moment a creature becomes aware of God as God and of itself as self, the terrible alternative of choosing God or self for the center is opened to it. This sin is committed daily by young children and ignorant peasants as well as by sophisticated persons, by solitaries no less than by those who live in society. It is the fall in every individual life and in each day of in each individual life the basic sin behind all particular sins. At this very moment, you and I are either committing it or about to commit it, or repenting it. We try when we wake to lay the new day at God's feet. Before we have finished shaving, it becomes our day, and God's share in it is felt as a tribute which we must pay out of our own pocket, a deduction from the time which ought we feel to be our own. A man starts a new job with a sense of vocation, and perhaps for the first week still keeps the discharge of the vocation as his, at his end, taking the pleasures and pains from God's hand as they come as accidents. But in the second week, he is beginning to know the ropes. By the third, he has quarried out of the total job his own plan for himself within that job. And when he can pursue this, he feels that he is getting no more than his rights, and when he cannot, that he is being interfered with. A lover in obedience to a quite uncalculating impulse may be full of goodwill, as well as of desire, and need not be forgetful of God, embraces his beloved, and then, quite innocently, experiences a thrill of sexual pleasure, but the second embrace may have that pleasure in view. Maybe a means to an end, maybe the first downward step towards the state of regarding a fellow creature as a thing, a machine to be used for his pleasure. Thus the bloom of innocence, the element of obedience, and the readiness to take what comes is rubbed off every activity. Thoughts undertaken for God's sake, like that on which we are engaged at the moment, are continued as if they were an end in themselves. And finally, as if our pleasure in thinking were the end. And finally, as if our pride or celebrity were the end. Thus, all day long and all the days of our life, we are sliding, slipping, falling away, as if God were, to our present consciousness, a smooth, inclined plane on which there is no resting. And indeed, now we are of such a nature that we must slip off, and the sin, because it is unavoidable, may be venial. But God cannot have made us so. Oh, we'll get there in a second. It seems 
not obvious, but at least pretty straightforward that this sin of pride of placing ourselves at the absolute center of everything and being the measure of everything does tend to govern and dictate everything. This is how, I mean, like, and this time of, of, uh, of illness and lockdowns and whatnot is very illustrative for these purposes because during this time of, of lockdown and clampdown and whatnot, this is when uh, we all get to look at things and say, all right, so we've received word that we have to wear masks inside and we have to stay two meters apart from people and wash our hands and no more than 30 people in, in, uh, in a worship service, no more than five people in a house. Okay. But people are still doing it. People are still going into places with no masks. People are still gathering in groups of more than five at home. People are still having larger gatherings than they should. They're still breaking the rules. Why they got to do that? What is that impulse that is forcing them to do that? And the answer to that is, generally speaking, and you will have some people, there will be people, I'm sure, who will say COVID-19 just doesn't exist. And it's all a big plan from Big Pharma to develop vaccines for a non-existent virus because it's just the flu. There are those people, fine. But for the people who believe that COVID-19 is a real disease, is a real virus, is contagious, but they will view themselves as the exception. They'll say, right, but it's just me and my friends. It's my gathering that I want to. It's my kid's sports team. It's, it's the thing that I want to do. Therefore, I kind of want to do it. And then that will, if you take enough people who are doing that, bring you to all kinds of misery and, and ill repute. People have asked me, they've said, Pastor Jim, nobody's actually asked me this, but I wish somebody would. Nobody has said, Pastor Jim, how is it that North Dakota has fewer people than Saskatchewan, but way more cases of COVID-19? How does that happen? Well, you know, Maxine makes a good point to say they didn't do what they were supposed to. Right, but here's the thing, is if you are the United States of America, you have much more of a culture of freedom than we do. Uh, I think it was North Dakota's governor, but it could have been South Dakota's governor. And if I'm wrong, and somebody who's from the Dakotas is going to yell at me and say, don't you know about the difference between the Dakotas? Sorry, I don't. But either the governor of North or South Dakota came on the radio and said, our people are free. That's her, Christy Noom. Is that, is that, that North, South Dakota? Right. Came on, and came on the radio and said, our people are happy because they are free. Now, freedom is just that, that you have the ability to make decisions for yourself. Now, again, as was pointed out from this side of the room correctly, even though you can have health recommendations and suggestions, if you're in a place like South Dakota that doesn't have or doesn't, isn't going to uh, enforce anything, you're relying on people's goodwill and their good effort to do what they're supposed to do. But it could turn out that they're not going to. And guess what? It does turn out that they're not going to. This should be of no surprise. If you leave the avenues open to people and say, well, just make good choices. We don't make good choices. That's the whole problem. Leaving, this, leaving the containment of, of a deadly disease up to the effort and goodwill and, and best intentions and better natures of human beings is going to lead to everybody dying. We don't have it. It is not in us. I know somebody will say, yes, but surely I've been doing a good job. Good, excellent, keep it up. But you have to understand that human beings, by and large, do not have that better impulse within them. They are suffering from fatigue. They're getting sick of things. They're saying, I'm just going to get together with my friends. I don't care if I die at this point. If you give them freedom, they are going to abuse that freedom. Now, if you take their freedom away so they can't abuse their freedom, well and good, but then you can't praise them for having done the right thing, right? Like if you're, if you're on, do you remember back in like March and April when we were like under a more strict lockdown than we are and restaurants are only open for like takeout and drive through and the church was basically closed and there were no sports or activities and our cases were way down we can't pride ourselves on having done such a good job boy weren't we good at this when in reality the average person just didn't have a choice there was nowhere to go there was nothing to do you couldn't go to sports because there weren't any you couldn't uh, go to the movies because they weren't open 
You couldn't go to church because it was closed. You had no choices on this one. Therefore, your free will didn't enter into it. But as soon as your free will does enter into it, all of a sudden everybody's running around and coughing on each other all the time. That's how this works. That's what the doctrine of the fall really is. And I'm so glad we have a current model to point to to say that that's why we have this doctrine. You can see it being played out large as life. If you give people freedom to choose to either do the right thing and stave off illness or to do whatever they feel like and incur illness, they will do the latter. That's how that works. The gravitation away from God, the journey homeward to habitual self, must, we think, be a product of the fall. What exactly happened when man fell, we do not know, but if it is legitimate to guess, I offer the following picture, a myth in the Socratic sense, not an unlikely tale. Um, I kind of want to skip it. <laughs> I kind of want to skip his tale because it sort of goes on and on. I don't think it works. Uh, and I, again, I like C.S. Lewis. I like him a lot. But he he's proposing, and I'm probably going to skip most of it, but he's proposing a human being that has like sort of mastery over everything, that like completely controls his own internal organs and his sleep and his... Are, are you familiar with this, Garth? Is this... Yeah, I don't think it works. I don't think it works at all. I, I think this thought experiment is, um, I mean, C.S. Lewis can't come after me now uh, because he's dead, but I'm going to... the modern Yeah, I know. He really shouldn't mention the modern yogi. In fact, he should have hired a modern editor to take this part out because I don't think it works. Uh, the idea that you, you're, that there was an initial human being who could choose to sleep and choose to be awake and choose to decay or choose to be alive and and, and have all of his vital functions working just on the basis of his own desire to have them do so. And then after the fall, all those things worked against him. I don't know, man. I don't know if it works. Uh, I kind of want to skip it uh, and skip it quite a bit. Good. Everybody in favor of me skipping that? Good. We're skipping to the... Um, we're skipping to the... We do not know how many of these creatures God made. What page is that on? 48. 48. Good. We do not know how many of these creatures God made, nor how long they continued in the paradisial state, but sooner or later they fell. That can work with the biblical approach too, by the way, to say we don't know how long they were in paradise, but sooner or later they fell. Fine. Someone or something whispered that they could become as gods, that they could cease directing their lives to the Creator and taking all their delights as uncovenanted mercies, as accidents in the logical sense, which arose in the course of a life directed not to those delights, but to the adoration of God. As a young man wants a regular allowance from his father, which he can account on his own, within which he makes his own plans, and rightly for his father is, after all, a fellow creature, so they desire to be on their own, to take care for their own future, to plan for pleasure and for security, to have a meum from which they, no doubt, would pay some reasonable tribute to God in the way of time, attention, and love, but nevertheless was, not, was theirs, not his. They wanted, as we say, to call their souls their own. But that means to live a lie, for our souls are not, in fact, our own. They wanted some corner of the universe in which they could say to God, this is our business, not yours. But there is no such corner. They wanted to be nouns, but they were and eternally must be mere adjectives. We have no idea in what particular act or series of acts the self-contradictory impossible wish found expression. For all I can see, it might have conquered a concern the literal eating of a fruit, but the question is of no consequence. And yeah, I mean, like to go back to what we were saying before, you are going to, no matter how long humans exist, you are going to have people wanting to do that because you see them wanting to do that now. You see them wanting to express this self-determination even in something that is self-destructive and, and destroys more than even just the self. People are going to want to do the wrong thing because it benefits them and they're going to want to you know, resist any implication that they should be stepping back from, from freedom. This act of self-will on the part of the creature, which constitutes an utter falseness to its true creaturely position, is the only sin that can be conceived as the fall. For the difficulty about the first sin is that it must be very heinous, or its consequences would not be so terrible, and yet it must be something which a being free from the temptations of fallen man could conceivably have committed. The turning from God to self fulfills both conditions. It is a sin possible even to paradisial man, because the mere existence of a self, the mere fact that we call it me, includes from the first the danger of self-idolatry. Since I am I, 
I must make an act of self-surrender, however small or however easy, and living to God rather than to myself. This is, if you like, the weak spot in the very nature of creation, the risk which God apparently thinks worth taking. But the sin was very heinous, because the self which paradisial man had to surrender contained no natural recalcitrancy to being surrendered. His data, so to speak, were a psychophysical organism wholly subject to the will, and a will wholly disposed, not compelled to turn to God. The self-surrender which he practiced before the fall meant no struggle, but only the delicious overcoming of an infinitesimal self-adherence, which delighted to be overcome, of which we see a dim analogy in the rapturous mutual self-surrenders of lovers even now. He had therefore no temptation in our sense to choose the self, no passion or inclination obstinately inclining that way, nothing but the bare fact that the self was himself. It's a very important distinction. A very important distinction uh, to say that, the, that he knew that the self was himself. And the temptation, like the temptations that we have now are things that we can't have and, and shouldn't want and things like that. But the only temptation that could have existed before the fall was the temptation to, to separate from God in some capacity, to have the self be more important uh, than God, or to allow that to make decisions. Pause for coffee. Hmm. Delicious. If you assume, rightly so, that, uh, that it would be a, a great shame for God to punish people forever for that one sin, you have to understand how likely that sin would be. Uh, and the answer is that that sin occurs all the time, all the time. In reality, the, one of the main reasons for people not wanting to be part of, of a church or of a, of a Christian organization or something like that is not because they've been so thoroughly convinced that the idea of God is nonsensical and doesn't apply, but that the God that exists in the Bible tells them not to do something that they want to do. And they say, well, instead of listening to that, I'm keen to listen to myself. Instead of voyaging further along that track, what I have in mind is to uh, be more informed about what I want to do than what God wants me to do. It's a very clear distinction, but boy, is it an important one. And that, that weak spot, as it says there, this weak spot in the nature of creation, the risk which God apparently thinks worth taking. Because the only way that God can have any kind of relationship with his creatures is if there is the possibility that this relationship might be broken. Otherwise, the relationship itself makes no sense. Uh, that's why, uh, Chris, how, Chris, how difficult would it be to, I'm not asking you to look for anything. How difficult would it be for you to uh, write a very quick computer program of just text messages that you could send and it would generate a reply from a fake girl who would be interested in everything you say? Uh, like one that's Turing complete? No, no, no. <laughs> but like just boilerplate a, stuff? Um, yeah. I don't know, the, the better part of a day, right. an afternoon even? Right. Now, now, the whole point about this is that if you are trying to appeal to a nice young lady, uh, what you're looking for is not just automatic responses to everything you do and everything you say. Rather, the only thing that makes your appeal to this nice young lady worth anything is because she doesn't have to give it to you. Uh, her, her desire for you must be voluntary, otherwise it is transactional or far worse than that, violent. Uh, once it becomes voluntary, then it becomes great and good and God-pleasing. But if it's, if it's forced or, or coerced or mandatory, then it loses all of its appeal very quickly. This is why children move from playing make-believe to playing games. Because, of course, once you are playing make-believe and everything will work the way you want it to work, there becomes no barrier to you doing whatever you want to do. Therefore, the game is a lot less interesting. If you can just magic solutions to everything you want to see all the time, that's a lot less interesting for you as a person than if there is some resistance, some challenge to overcome. If we did not have this weak spot, if we were just mere autonomous, uh, like clockwork soldiers or whatever that had to do what we were programmed to do, then there would be no reason for our existence in the first place based on what God apparently wants us to be. Uh, if he does not wish for us to have this, then it seems a very funny way of us existing like this. And anybody who says, well, can't God have made us both with free will and incapable of ever disappointing him? And the answer is no. That's not how that works. 
uh, if there is free will, it has to be free. That's like saying the, you can have a Model T Ford in every color as long as it's black. What's the point? Uh, supper tonight is fish, take it or leave it, right? There's your choice. Up to that moment, the human spirit had been in full control of the human organism. It doubtless expected that it would retain this control and had ceased to obey God, but its authority over the organism... Yeah, I'm going to skip this part too. Well, because it's an extension of his first thing to say, boy, I, I, he's really getting... It's very esoteric and, and, and kind of silly, and it doesn't go where he wants it to go. But like the, I guess the point that we can make is to say that maybe just, and like this idea that you can say people should be able to have free will but also no consequences is the same as asking, can't Adam and Eve have eaten of that fruit and still been in paradise? And the answer is no, uh, because that's not how that works. If there are real decisions, they have to have consequences. That's about it. Anytime he says psychophysical organism, I, I stop listening. Um, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, skip that too. So let, let's, let's go to the paragraph that starts with our present condition then. That, that seems safe enough to the start there. Where, what, what page is that on? 52. 52. Our present condition, then, is explained by the fact that we are members of a spoiled species. I do not mean that our sufferings are a punishment for being what we cannot help being, nor that we are morally responsible for the rebellion of a remote ancestor. If, nonetheless, I call our present condition one of original sin and not merely one of original misfortune, that is because our actual religious experience does not allow us to regard it in any other way. Theoretically, I suppose, we might say, yes, we behave like vermin, but that is because we are vermin, and that, at any rate, is not our fault. But the fact that we are a vermin, so far as from being felt as an excuse, is a greater shame and grief to us than any of the particular acts which it leads us to commit. The situation is not nearly so hard to understand as some people make out. It arises among human beings whenever a very badly brought up boy is introduced to a decent family. They rightly remind themselves that it is not his fault that he is a bully, a coward, a tail-bearer, and a liar. Ooh, those tail-bearers. But nonetheless, however it came there, his present character is detestable. They not only hate it, but ought to hate it. They cannot love him for what he is. They can only try to turn him into what he is not. In the meantime, though the boy is most unfortunate having been so brought up, you cannot call his character a misfortune, as if he were one thing and his character another. It is he, he himself, who bullies and sneaks and likes doing it. And if he begins to mend, he will be inevitably feel shame and guilt at what he is just beginning to cease to be. Hey, C.S. Lewis just said he bullies and likes doing it. Good, take that pink shirt day that I, that I laid into on Sunday. Yeah, um, this, we should want better than we have. Like, it's, it's, I don't think it's done us a whole lot of good to surrender on all these grounds and to say, yeah, we're, we're fallen creatures and that's just how things are and, and who cares. That seems inadequate, especially if we're trying to make any kind of progress forward to say that we are going to have to deal with the fact that people are, are bad and this level of badness is to be expected and, and rewarded and to be accepted as the new norm, when in reality, uh, that, par that part there that says they cannot love him for what he is, they can only try to turn him into what he is not, boy, if you're a parent of a child, you both love your child for what they are, but you are always trying to turn them into what they are not. You are, you are never content to just say, oh, my child just likes... Uh, lying and stealing and, and bullying other kids. That's just who he is, and I love him for what he is, warts and all. No, like if you're parenting your child, you want desperately to turn them into what they are not. Not to like wipe out their personalities, but you sure aren't ever content to just leave them where they are. With this, I have said all that can be said on the level of which I feel able to treat the subject of the fall. In fact, C.S. Lewis, you've said too much because we skipped a bunch of it. But I warn my readers that once more this is a level is a shallow one. We have said nothing about the trees of life and knowledge which doubtless conceal some great mystery. And we have said nothing about the Pauline statement that, if, that as in Adam all die, so in Christ all shall be made alive. It is this passage which lies behind the patristic doctrine of our physical presence in Adam's loins and Anselm's doctrine of our inclusion by legal fiction in the suffering Christ. These theories may have done good in their day, but they do no good to me, and I'm not going to invent others. Really? We have recently been told by the scientists that we have no right to expect that the real universe should be picturable, and that if we make mental pictures to illustrate quantum physics, we are moving away further from reality, not nearer to it. 
we have clearly seen even less right to demand that the highest spiritual reality should be picturable or even explicable in terms of our abstract thought. I observe that the difficulty of the Pauline formula turns on the word in, and this word again and again in the New Testament is used in senses we cannot fully understand. That we can die in Adam and live in Christ seems to me to imply that man as he really is differs a good deal from our man as our categories of thought and our three-dimensional imaginations represent him. That the separateness modified only by causal relations which we discern between individuals is balanced in absolute reality by some kind of inter-inanimation of which we have no conception at all. It may be that the acts and sufferings of great archetypical individuals such as Adam and Christ are ours not by legal fiction, metaphor, or causality, but in some much deeper fashion. There is no question, of course, of individuals melting down into a kind of spiritual continuum, such as pantheistic systems believe in, but that is excluded by the whole tenor of our faith. But there may be a tension between individuality and some other principle. We believe that the Holy Spirit can be really present and operative in the human spirit, but we do not, like pantheists, take this to mean that we are parts, modifications, or appearances of God. We may have to suppose in the long run that something of the same kind is true in its appropriate degree, even of created spirits, that each, though distinct, is really present in all or in some others, just as we have to admit action at a distance into our own conception of matter. Let's stop there for a second and mention that the fall, even like after all of his like gobbledygook, um, part of that does make sense that following the fall, a couple of things happen. First of all, that we know that the world isn't good or perfect, but secondly, that we always have in mind that the world can and should uh, be different than it is. We're all sort of appealing to a moral standard. There, there's, a, there's a phrase, a two-word phrase that's very popular right now that just says, be better. And boy, oh boy, uh, do I grow weary of that phrase. And the reason I grow weary of the phrase is it because it, it heavily implies uh, that there is a, a, a separate higher moral standard to which we should all be reaching towards, but it never actually talks about what that standard actually is. It just says that we should be better, but it cannot ever define what, what good is. Like Without you having a strict moral framework that you can't change at any given moment, all you can do is say to people you should improve, but not tell them what they're supposed to be improving towards. That's a vital part of this question, right? To say to people, we need you to be better, but to talk about what better actually is. And for we as Christians, we understand that that's perfected in Christ. And that's why they have books that say things like the imitation of Christ and whatnot, to give you an idea of what you should be attaining or striving towards. Paul says, be imitators of me as I am an imitator of Christ, makes sense. But if, if you're just saying to people, you should be better, without having a, like, like, like a final end stop to say, this is what good is, and it stops there. And then if you say that to somebody, if you say, this is what good is, the Ten Commandments, let's say, for example, and then if somebody is breaking those Ten Commandments, you can say to them, be better vis-a-vis -vis this scale, without just saying to them, be better into a vacuum. Improve, but we're not gonna tell you what, improve, what you're improving towards, because that definition will change and grow and develop. So your version of better today might be totally different tomorrow, and you will always have to progress further, no matter how good you've gotten. So yeah, like we, we do, whether people believe in God or not, they want people to be better. The only difference is that we would say that there is a hard stop for what that better actually is, and we can define it. Everyone will have noticed how the Old Testament seems at times to ignore our conception of the individual. When God promises Jacob that he will go down with him into Egypt and will also surely bring him up again, this is fulfilled either by the burial of Jacob's body in Palestine or by the exodus of Jacob's descendants from Egypt. It is quite right to connect this notion with the social structure of early communities in which the individual is constantly overlooked in favor of the tribe or family. But we ought to express this connection by two propositions of equal importance. Firstly, that their social experience blinded the ancients to some truth which we perceive, and secondly, that it made them sensible of some truths which we are, to which we are blind. Legal fiction, adoption, and transference, or imputation of merit and guilt could never have played the part they did play in theology if they had always been felt to be so artificial as we feel them now to be. I have thought it right to allow this one glance at what it means for me an impenetrable curtain, but as I have said, it makes no part of my present argument. Clearly, it would be futile to attempt to solve the problem of pain by producing another problem. The thesis of this chapter is simply that man as a species spoiled himself and that good to us in our present state must therefore mean primarily remedial or corrective good. What, pain, what part pain actually plays in such remedy or correction is now to be considered.
if you understand or know or take seriously the idea that there is a standard, a, a better standard of right and wrong than we are currently doing that you are appealing to, and that you seem to think that it's good for people to want to appeal to that, then you are making the case already that people are fallen creatures. What you're not saying is you're not saying to people, it doesn't matter what you do, have fun. What you're doing is you're saying it does matter what you do, what you do, what you say, how you behave is important and vitally so, and there is a standard to which we are all going to be holding each other. Once we've worked that out, then the question, as has come up before, says, why do we have this standard if none of us are keeping it? And the answer to that is because we know the standard is good, and the reason we don't keep it is because we ourselves are fallen. And that's a very important part of, of the question, the conundrum. Without wrapping that up, like if you assume that people are generally good, then you have to account for the fact that people aren't good. And if you also believe that people can be better, then you have to account for the idea that people don't. So then what we would say is that people are, are fatally flawed in the virtue of pride, which will knock them off and make them incapable of doing the right thing, but it doesn't change the rightness of the thing that they feel they are called to do. If we were basing things only around what people found possible, then we would just scrap all of our laws and all of our morals and just go with what we think we can do. But the inherent problem with that, and I'll stop on this, I promise, but the inherent problem with that is that it's a, it, it ends up being a death spiral, where if you change your morals every generation to fit what that generation is capable of doing, that generation will always undercut what they, what they were told to do, even if it was very simple. So if every generation you, you have in mind something very high-minded and good and noble, then that generation comes and they are incapable of doing that, so then for the next generation you make those laws less high-minded and less noble. Well, they're going to come around and not do that either. Then if you adjust these morals to fit what they're capable of doing, every time you will sink lower and lower and lower. You will spiral down lower and lower and lower because you will change your morals to fit the behavior, but then the behavior will slip under the morals which they do every time. We have, and, and COVID-19, again, should suggest to you that even if the rules are fairly simple, people are not going to keep them. Uh, this right now is effectively, anybody who's ever questioned, they said, well, why did Adam and Eve eat the apple? Like, surely they could have just not done that. Why was that so tempting? All they had to do was not do that, and they would have lived. Well, genius. Right now, we're in a space where we have some pretty simple rules to follow. If we just did these, people would be by and large fine. But you're like, well, yeah, but don't really feel like it, so therefore not going to do it. All right, other questions in the chat or questions from the room? Hmm. All right, that's fair. Then, Chris, if we can sign off for now, that would make me smile. You can't tell because I'm wearing a mask, but I would smile. <laughs>